They are working. They have been working for us for over 10,000 years. They have been called man's best friend, soft fur and wet nose, smart and loyal, aiding us in transportation, hunting, companionship, protection, and many more ways. They share a bond with us like no other animal. They are career dogs. And this is a look into the history, training, and duties of jobs that can only be fulfilled by our four-legged friends. When you take a dog on a walk, nearly half their time is spent sniffing everything using their keen sense of smell. Their keen sense of smell that has been put to use in two very different jobs. One of the oldest jobs, hunting, and one of the newest dog jobs, search and rescue. This dog appears to be aimlessly wandering through the wilderness, but in reality, it is tracking the wind on the scent of a missing person. Well-trained dogs like this and dedicated handlers work together for this very important life-saving dog job. Search and rescue dogs detect scent, most likely from the scent-carrying skin cells that drop off humans at a rate of 40,000 cells per minute, called skin rafts evaporated perspiration, respiratory gases, and decomposition gases released by bacteria on human skin or tissues also probably play a role in a successful search and rescue mission. These remarkable dogs can be divided into two broad categories, one, air-scenting area search dogs, and two, trailing tracking dogs. Tracking dogs typically work on a lead and will have their nose to the track following ground disturbance, working through a variety of terrain. A trailing dog is scent specific, working on lead to follow their subject's pools of scent. Here we have a tracking dog following the scent of a bad guy. We like a, we like a tracking dog that keeps his head down, nose to the ground, and is gonna work that human odor uh, that is collecting up on the ground and using a combination of that human odor on the ground and ground disturbance as you step and break up the vegetation a little bit. Some dogs are trained to work in avalanche rescues. The St. Bernard was famous for saving lives in this type of condition. Since the early 18th century, monks were living in the dangerous snowy St. Bernard Pass between Italy and Switzerland and kept the dogs to help aid in rescue missions after bad snowstorms. Over a span of 200 years, over 2,000 people were rescued by the heroic breed's sense of direction, smell, and cold resistance. The body of Barry, a famous St. Bernard that saved over 40 people, is on display in the Natural History Museum in Bern, Switzerland. In the case of air scent dogs, they detect the scent-bearing particles humans emit carried by the wind. Airborne scent is concentrated near its source and becomes more dilute the further it carries. The search and rescue dog, commonly called a SAR dog, would be able to locate the scent of any human in a specific area and can do so from over half a mile away. They are a valuable part of a search and rescue team, able to cover the same area as 50 human searchers. These dogs are also adept at searching at night Air-scenting dogs can be used in almost any weather because although strong wind, snow, or heavy rain may destroy all traces of a subject's track, the subject will still emit scent. A breeze or moderate wind actually helps a dog in its search. Air-scenting dogs work well in most searches, except for urban areas where there are crowds of people. There are other search and rescue specialties, such as cadaver dogs, which detect human remains. Melissa Kent is an area director for Sardoc, okay, search and rescue dogs of Colorado, and works with Hawk, a cadaver dog. 
The majority of search and rescue dogs are live scent dogs. Um, they go out and they find people that are alive. Uh, and we use, in search and rescue dogs of Colorado, we use scent articles, so all of our dogs are scent specific. Um, they will pick a person out, out in the wilderness. They won't go to other people. Um, but we do have the ability to search without a scent article if we can't get one. And um, in that case, if there are other people out there, they can actually be a help to us because we can go and ask them if they've seen the person that we're looking for. So, and the cadaver dogs, um, we train them. We do get um, donations of body parts from people that have passed away or um, a lot of moms donate their placentas to us to use. Um, and so we use those in varying states of decomposition and we train our dogs on those. And um, we use those to so that the dog understands that they're looking for a deceased human, not a deceased deer, raccoon, whatever. They know the difference, and we proof them off of the other animals, too. Training for the search and rescue dog is rigorous, time-consuming, and comprehensive. Training typically begins early in life with obedience training using positive reinforcement. Handler canine bonding, socialization, agility, and advanced training also makes for a great SAR dog. Scent training then begins, which focuses on a dog's natural instincts. Most dogs are instinctual hunters, and we're, that's, if you really want to get down to the basics, that's what we're doing, is we're hunting for people. There's just no bad result at the end, hopefully. Um, <laughs> and so they, they follow through their drive, and a lot of that is scent-based. And so we just kind of really focus them on using their scent and focus them on using their hunting instincts to go find people. Chris Robertson is in the process of getting his dog, Bohannon, Air Scent certified. His process, I got him at about eight weeks and I bonded with him for um, about four weeks. Just no, no type of um, training, not even sit, stay, here, any of that. It was all about building a bond between him and I. And then after that, uh, we started moving into um, a simple runaway program. So the person runs away and uh, the dog runs to the person and gets a reward. And then that, you just keep on building that to where he no longer sees the person or the person walks out of sight and the dog now has to engage his nose instead of his eyes to find the person. Um, and once you've got a solid nose engagement, then you start working beyond that to where he shows up and the, he never sees the person, he's just presented a scent article. That's the scent you, you locate and you tie that this scent equals your reward, go find the source of this scent. Whether it be deposited, sit on the ground in the form of a trail, follow that from, it's kind of like a game of hot and cold, you know, oh, it's colder here, I need to follow it till it's warmer and warmer and warmer until I find the person, to the air scent where I'm gonna work the air currents, I'm gonna find the hottest hit in the air currents, and then work that source of the air currents. If you really get to see a dog watch, especially from on top, like if you use an aircraft or a drone, it's almost like watching a fish swim in the stream as they're moving through the scent cone, call it a cone, the cone comes out. The dog hit the edges and they're just working that edge all the way in until they find the strongest concentration of scent. We look for drive, which is um, the desire to meet that end. So um, a lot of dogs, the, um, the border collies, the herding dogs, they kind of have like a, a herding drive where they want to keep their herds together. Um, we have those guys, we have um, your hunting dogs that want, you know, their instinctual drive is the prey drive, so they want to catch their prey. Um, any of those prey drives we can channel into like a toy drive, so Hawk um, really likes his ball a lot. And so that's his, that's his reward at the end of a, a search. And um, other dogs are food, they're food motivated, so we do food drive with them, but they need to, to have the drive to follow through and sometimes they're searching for up to six hours at a time. So they need to be able to, you know, they, they want it so bad that they will search for six hours to get that reward, even though it's just that little, little ball. <laughs> it's all about making it super fun for them. And that's, it's not, you know, for us, we consider it their job, but they don't know what a job is, it's a game. It's just a big game for them. <laughs> Allison Yelton is the training director of Sardoc. She took us out on a scheduled training with Sprite and her handler, Jay Rigdon. So he's going to use the wind um, to his advantage to help find the subject. Uh, so his subject is somewhere to the north of us here. Right now he's gonna give her um, a piece of cloth that smells like the subject she's supposed to find. Um, so she knows who she's looking for. 
So in a search, if you have a missing person, these dogs are used to clear areas or find the subject in the area. Um, so the person running the search will divide up their most likely areas and assign this dog team a big plot of land and say, you know, go out there and clear it. Or if the subject's in there, then the dog should find them in that location. And area search dogs or air scent dogs like this one, um, you can work multiple dogs so they can do divide your search area up into quadrants or any number of segments and you can work multiple dogs in separate um, areas to clear them as quickly as possible and get to your um, lost person as fast as possible. We have a lost person out here. Um, he's somewhere in this area. We've given the handler, Jay, um, just some boundaries like the creek. Um, there's a fence line up here and the new trail over there. And that's his search area. So he has to um, determine a strategy based on the wind and the terrain that's gonna be most likely for him to uh, locate that subject as quickly as possible in his area. As we continued the search, the winds changed. When we walked out here, we kind of had a different wind. And so it's very challenging for the handlers because they'll base their strategy on say a west wind and then never fails. You get halfway through your area and the wind shifts. And now you have to try to still provide that high level of coverage, but you have to completely adapt and change your strategy, you know, based on the ever changing conditions that you're working in. After working the area for over half an hour, Sprite was successful in finding the missing person. So she kept working the, working the wind and got downwind of our subject here and then um, went all the way into him. Um, one of the most critical pieces with the search dogs, especially the area search dogs, is they have to come back and tell their human they found him. And so she came back to her handler and her alert is she jumps on him and then runs back to the subject. And as the handler and dog work together to change lives, the bond that forms is an extraordinary one, seen here in this rescue exercise. Melissa reflects on the bond between her and her dog. He is absolutely the closest dog that I've ever had. Um, I might cry. <laughs> um, we are super reliant on each other and uh, we're a team. I mean, that's really, you can't really put it in words. I mean, everybody that loves animals and probably anybody that's gonna watch this loves dogs and loves animals. So they understand how close you can be to your animals. And um, with him, it's probably even more than most people understand. They're your partner, they're your comrade. They, um, you are just like team, team doesn't even begin to describe it, you know? Um, like there's just so much trust back and forth that you build with this dog and they trust you to take care of them and they trust you to get them to where they're going to be successful and you trust them that when you turn them loose that they're out there working despite all the distractions beside despite the critters despite the humans despite the doubt you know and that relationship with them is just uh, it's indescribable <laughs> It's one of the oldest jobs a dog has had, working with humans as a hunting partner. That partnership undoubtedly began as wolves joined the hunt with early humans. Using their keen sense of smell and agility, wolves completed the team for a successful hunt. As wolves evolved into dogs, dogs took up the role as the trusted hunting partner. The dog-human partnership became specialized for different game including retrieving waterfowl, such as ducks and geese, and upland birds, such as turkeys and pheasant. Marty Knupp is the owner of Knupp Kennels, a training facility based in Newton, North Carolina for upland hunting dogs. 
Um, years ago, the dogs were used to hunt uh, you know, cows and livestock and things of that nature. Then we domesticated those animals. So then the roles of, of dogs and actually hunting kind of changed a little bit. Then they went to more of an overseeing of the livestock and stuff like that. Um, at that point, Hunting kind of with dogs kind of became more of a sport. Hunting dogs and, and so forth really came about uh, as a as a prestige. Um, you had your uh, your well-to-do people that would take your your English pointers and English setters were the predominant breeds back uh, in the day. They would take those dogs out and actually do bird hunting. And that was back when you had cubbies, the quail, and and you had you know just vast vast majority of, of game birds and upland birds. So. Those uh, those dogs, and that's that's kind of where the sport of the hunting really came into play. Now you've got it in so many different variations. You've got field trials, um, you've got hunting for sport, you've got guiding. You know, you've got guys that go out and, and hunt for meat. That actually, you know, they don't care if their dogs registered or pedigreed or anything. It's so it's, it's a really diverse uh, sporting dog world now. Today, there are three types of hunting dogs based on appearance and abilities: hounds, gun dogs and terriers. Originally developed in Great Britain to control rats, rabbits, and foxes, terriers are small dogs used for hunting small prey and tracking larger wounded animals. They locate the den of the target animal and then bolt, capture, or kill it. The word terrier fittingly comes from the Latin word for earth. The second hunting group, gun dogs, are used to locate and retrieve game, usually birds. These dogs are divided further into three types, pointers and setters, flushing dogs, and retrievers. For pointers and setters, a handler will cast or direct the dog in a wide circle. This helps the dog to establish its bearings to work back and forth, starting near the hunter in order to locate prey. When the dog detects prey, it will freeze and point or crouch. Flushing dogs work more closely with the hunter as they must be kept within shooting distance. They are often used on birds that would run from a hunter, such as pheasants. Once the bird has been flushed, the dog will watch the flight of the bird and where it lands for retrieval. This is where retrievers like Labradors come in, usually used for waterfowl hunting and small game. A waterfowl dog, um which is, you know, it could be any variation of short hairs, labs, anything like that. But some of the skill sets they need is to be able to be attentive enough to be able to sit and stay and wait and watch. You have to be good and alert, you have to be quiet, you have to be kind of alert to, you know, if there's ducks in a pond or, or in a swamp or something that are coming in, you know, a lot of dogs want to break. But when they break, the ducks are going to fly out. So you need them to come close. Sometimes they'll decoy four or five times before they actually land in the water. So you need a dog that's going to be able to sit staunch and just hold still, kind of unlike Phoenix here. And uh, you need them just to, to be waiting and, and ready, and then when you shoot, to go get them. The third hunting dog category is the hound, used for chasing an animal. A hunting sport known as the fox hunt was carried on by the elite of Europe and the United States for many years. The hound breeds used in the hunt typically have a loud bark and excellent noses and are good for hunting deer, coyote, wild boar, rabbit, and foxes. Some are even specialized in treeing game, such as squirrels, raccoons, and even bears. Sighthounds are tall with long legs bred for speed. Today, the classic fox hunting practice is being banned across much of the world. Then there are the scent hounds, like the bloodhound, Hounds that were bred to have bodies low to the ground and long ears that funnel the prey's scent to their noses. Their large nostril snouts and loose skin help them process the odors they detect. However, there are a few traits you want in any hunting dog. If I'm actually looking for a dog that I'm going to be uh, purchasing for Canup Kennels, for me, I'm looking for a dog that's extroverted. I want one that's going to be exploring, uh, using his nose to find his mom uh, when they're in the whelping pen. Um, I'm looking for a dog that, that doesn't really have any fear. Um, it seems like those are the, and, and there's a, you know, that's, that's being pretty broad because a lot of dogs are like that, but that's what I typically look for. And then I let the dog choose me a lot. This little dog here, this is Phoenix. And um, I, uh, he's out of, of my last litter that I had around Christmas. And Phoenix here, uh, I didn't intend on keeping any of my puppies, but uh, he really imprinted me and just really 
took to me and, and I kind of thought, okay, that's the dog that chose me, so I'm going to choose him back. And that's kind of the way I do when I'm looking at dogs. Besides extroversion, you also want a dog that is sneaky and fast, able to pick up a fast speed the moment it's needed. When bird hunting, having a soft jaw is important to carry the game gently in their mouth so as to not mangle the animal. Furthermore, a good hunting dog needs a short coat to avoid getting caught in the underbrush. As for training, it starts early in life. Training a dog, uh, it starts early. Um, obviously, you can start as early as the mom and the dad. You know, if you have two good dogs that are well-bred and, and good hunters, you want to breed those dogs to get a good puppy. Um, in that in that puppy stage, that's really where the training begins. You want to make a lot of noise, a lot of loud noises. Um, that, that helps the dogs get over being gun shy. Um, you want them to be really, really excited to see you. More extroverted the dog is, the better it is to train, in my uh, personal opinion. You want the dog to, to be really attentive and alert to you. So in that training, that's when it really starts in the puppy stages. And then it goes through um, like yard training, check cord training, where we're looking at um, healing, woeing. And then we implement a command of retrieving, you know, and coming and all these different commands and they all come into play and transition. I've had dogs that are out of my litters turned out and hunting wild birds in Nebraska um, as early as four months old and doing really well. I've seen other dogs that could take a year. Uh, every dog learns at a different rate and a different speed, just like people. Um, you have different breeds of dogs. These are German short hairs, and they're usually a pretty, pretty rapid, uh, pretty rapid dog as far as learning and, and pretty attentive and alert to everything. Then you know you have other dogs like English setters. You know sometimes it takes a setter close to a year to be able to uh, really get it. But once they get it they're good to go. Whereas you might have to retrain a short hair after that first or second year, just on minor details to brush them up. Marty showed us some of his training techniques. So it all starts with these check cords and just letting them get used to that. So this is what we call yard training and basically it happens in the yard. So this is where we teach the dog basic commands like come, stay, whoa, um, we're going to use a woe bench here in a minute, but this is Journey. <laughs> Turn around, buddy. So Journey is a German short hair pointer. Um, he's actually out of my Canup Kennels line. But uh, so this is a good, this is where, see how he turned around and went to the left side. This is where we want our dog to heal. Um, a heel command means that they stay on our heel. They stay on our, our side. I like to heal a dog on the left side. Um, that way this kind of creates a buffer zone. If I'm running, if I'm walking against traffic, then I'll see the traffic and it's kind of, I'm the safety barrier there. So the dog's always in this safe zone and I'm the one that's looking out for that. Also, I'm right handed and I carry my gun on my right side. So if I ever trip and fall, I can cascade my gun away and journey will be safe or the dog will be safe. So we start here in this heel position and we'll teach the dog to heel. Heel, 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 heel. This is probably the second time I've ever done this with him. So you can see how he's pulling right here. See this collar? What he should be doing is walking very leisurely beside me. So he's very new at this. So he's, this is all in the learning process. Um, so again, this heel, heel, heel. And you can see me kind of pop his collar to get him a little uncomfortable where he's, he's kind of acknowledging what we're doing. Heel, heel. Then we're gonna implement a command called whoa, which means stand still. Whoa, whoa. You can see he's got that pretty good. Whoa! So we don't want him to take a step. If you let a dog, an extroverted dog, take a step, he's going to take a mile. So we want him to stay at that step. Whoa! Whoa! So I'm going to entice him to move. Whoa! See how he's fighting back at me? That's what we want. Good boy. Good boy. Then we implemented that come command right there. So it's all, it all kind of plays into this yard training. And once you get into the yard training, or once you get, achieve the yard training, then you're ready to go and put birds out for the dog. Next, Marty took us on an upland hunting training demonstration with his dogs. After placing training birds for the dogs to find, he prepared Journey for his first wild bird hunt. So we put the birds on the ground, and what we're going to do now is uh, get the actual dog out and work it to the birds. We're going to make him point the bird, and then we're going to shoot the bird and see if he's going to retrieve the bird. Um, now, he's never done this before, so I don't know what we're going to get here. We'll try him on the first one, see how it goes, and then go accordingly. Yeah, what's the matter? Tell me about it. Hunt him up.
Come on, find it, hunt him up. Dead, dead, dead. So he's got to use his nose and relocate it. There he goes, good boy, fetch it up. <whistles> fetch it up, drop, drop, good boy. And that's exactly what he's supposed to do. Whoa, whoa. Now we didn't shoot that bird because he didn't hold that point. He broke that point. <clears throat> so we'll just move right along. He's, he's getting more confident. This is the third bird we've seen. Now he's pointing it over here, and we know because we put these birds out that the bird's actually here. But the fact that he's holding that point, he's showing his confidence. Come on. There he goes, see him hit that scent. Find it, dead, 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 dead. Look here, look here, dead, 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 dead. Good boy, fetch it up, good boy. Good boy, drop, drop. Good boy, good boy. So that's exactly what, what we want. Good boy, good boy. Now he wants to hunt like crazy. Come here, come here. Journey, come here. Good boy, good boy. It's an unspoken language. A dog understands where you go. It's almost like they can, they've made it thousands and thousands of years on manipulation of, of the hunter and of the man. So it's almost like they learn you, they understand where you're at, where you're gonna go, how you wanna hunt the field, where you wanna go next, and they do it. And it's, it's just, it's amazing to see that happen. Then when the hunt's over, and uh, you're back at the lodge, you're back at home, and, and you're eating your, your bounty of the day, you know, the, the birds that you harvested. Your dog just wants to be loved and be a companion. So it's right there with you, it's loyal. It's, it's almost like, you know, any, unlike any relationship we have as humans, you know, it seems like we're always being let down. I don't think I've ever been let down by a dog. The human and dog team, forming an irreplaceable bond, a bond saving lives and putting food on the table.